Have you ever been to a scrapyard where old electronics are recycled? I recently had the opportunity to visit one, and I wasn't certain about what to expect, but I can confidently say that I was far from disappointed. So, scrap hunting, will this be one of my new hobbies? The person who brought me to this scrapyard describes it as the magical place. I guess it's a question of perspective, but I tend to agree with him. But was my first trip worth the effort? Sweating under the sun, digging through bags of CPUs? Next to a couple of slot 1 CPUs, I was able to find an Asus P2B, some sort of GeForce graphics card, a Sound Blaster Odyssey, many CPUs, and this. A dual slot 1 motherboard, an Asus P2 L97 DS in revision 1.03. But those will have to wait for a future video slot. Today I want to have a look at an IDE hard drive from 1993, a Quantum Go Drive AT120, which I also stumbled upon at the magical place. The question is if it still works. All I know is that this drive was thrown into a pile of other hard drives and in the process a rigid flex connector cable was damaged. Before we can try this drive, I need to fix this cable. A simple reconnection of the traces using solder will probably not be enough. My plan is to reconnect the traces using a thin wire. But as you can see, the flex cable was punctured badly and over half of the traces are cut. I need to align the traces and hold them somehow in place. The best idea I could come up with is to use some captain tape on the back of the flex cable and then work on the other side reconnecting the traces. Once the cable is repaired, I can cover the front as well to protect the reworked traces. I have never repaired a cable like this before, so let's find out if my plan will actually work. But before we get into my repair attempt, a quick word from today's sponsor, PCBWay.com, because they are actually able to manufacture flexible PCBs, similar to the one I'm trying to repair today. PCBWay is also able to produce all kinds of other printed circuit boards, and you have seen me use their products in many of my projects on this channel. PCBWay offers more services, including PCB assembly, CNC machining, and 3D printing. You should definitely check out PCBWay's website and learn more about their production capabilities. Links to PCBWay.com and my shared projects are in the video description. The back of the flex cable has the captain tape attached and as you can see here, the traces are nicely aligned. Now we need to uncover parts of the copper traces to be able to reconnect them. Since I always had a good experience uncovering traces with an engraving pen, I tried this method for the flex cable as well. And it worked quite well. Even though the material is different to solder mask, the engraving pen has no issues removing the upper layer of the cable and exposing the copper traces. Now we can apply some flux and solder in preparation to attach tiny wires across the broken flex cable. I want to avoid to burn or melt the material the cable is made of, so I try to keep the time when the soldering iron is touching the cable to a minimum. But as it turns out, this cable is quite resilient. It is actually made to withstand high temperatures and humidity. With the ends of the traces tinned, I can start attaching the wires. After fixing the first two traces, I got a lot more confident and fixing the remaining broken traces got a lot easier. What I am doing is to attach the tiny wire to one side first and then reflow the solder while holding it down with a piece of wood. I was quite surprised that this worked as well as it did. The traces seem to be firmly reattached and they should be strong enough to withstand bending to a certain degree. Of course it won't be as flexible and rigid like a new cable, but for the purpose of testing this drive, it should be more than enough. For the last trace, which is clearly a lot bigger than the others, I use the same wire, but bend into a U shape. And because the trace is much wider, more solder is also attaching to the broken trace. This must be part of a power delivery system, so it is good to have a proper connection here. And we're done. Now just a bit of cleaning and reapply fresh captain tape on both sides.
Now we can answer the question if this drive still works. I connected it to a Pentium system and the Quantum Go drive did power up with the regular noises you would expect. However, the drive was not detected by the BIOS. I tried to reboot several times hoping for a different outcome, but each time without success. There is also something odd going on with this drive. 10 seconds after the drive reached its final rotation speed, it powered down. Since I did not know what to do next, I tried to find more information online and if other people experienced the same behavior. There is a video on YouTube talking about this drive, made by the Tech Knight, uploaded over 10 years ago. In his video he explained an internal issue that plagues all Quantum Go drives. There is a stopper made of rubber inside the drive which should prevent the read and write heads from crashing into the rotating spindle. Unfortunately, this rubber part seems to disintegrate over time, to a point where it just melts away. We can see that this drive does have the part in question because of this metal insert that is visible here. At this point I wonder if this drive is actually salvageable. Based on the information from Tech Knight's video, I have my doubts. So let's investigate and have a look inside the drive. I am fully aware that once we cross a certain point this drive will be unrepairable. But that's ok, I have no hopes for this drive anymore. Well, at least I can make this video. So let's get the cover off this drive. Maybe you have heard of more recent drives that are properly sealed and sometimes filled with helium to reduce the drag on its spinning platters. In comparison, the cover of this quantum drive is just screwed to the top of the metal housing, held in place with four small metal screws. And here are the disc platters. Now you can listen to the drive and you can see how it powers off after about 10 seconds into the boot process. And here is what I was talking about. The drive spins up regularly and then after a while it stops. Maybe you can also hear a slight ticking sound. I think that might be an issue as well. I think the platters are hitting against the actuator arm or the read and write heads. Well, you have seen how those drives are handled at the scrapyard. So it is in the realm of possibilities that due to a harsh impact the internal mechanism or the alignment was damaged. I moved the actuator arm slightly towards the center to see if the drive behaves differently. Only when moving it into the middle of the platter, the behavior changed. And here is what the Tech Knight warned from. I have a feeling that we may have the issue with a melting rubber stopper. Let's get those platters out. The drive is dead anyway. There are four screws that hold the platters in place. The first platter can be removed easily, but the one further down is impossible to be removed without disassembling the actuator arm. There is just one single screw to hold the assembly in place. Once the screw is removed, I can move the arms away from the platters and finally freeing the second platter. And here we are. Here is the rubber stopper. But it looks okay? Did I just ruin the drive for no reason? Well, the moment I touch the black rubber, or what is supposed to be rubber, you can see that this is no longer rubber. It is some gooey mess that probably was rubber some time ago. But right now, it is no longer doing its job preventing the actuator arm from crashing into the rotating spindle. What do you think about this material? Do you also think that this is weird that rubber can transform into something like this? And here you can see a black spot on the actuator arm. It clearly touched the melted rubber and took some of it with it. Unfortunately it is as I had feared after seeing the Tech Knight's video. The rubber melted and lost its ability to save the arm from crashing into the spindle. I cannot tell if this is the actual reason why the drive appears to be dead or if it was the mishandling at the scrapyard. But I believe this drive was beyond repair before I found it. What do you think about this fault? Is this a design flaw? Or do you believe this to be planned obsolescence? All I can think of is that it is not just a device that can be easily replaced. Those drives did hold personal and important data of their users. 
It is very unfortunate that many people may have lost their precious files because of a rubber stopper that costs just a few cents, or even less. Unfortunately, this drive will go back to the recycling center, but be assured that I will pick up some more interesting parts from there. If you can and want to support me bringing those old computer parts to you in form of YouTube videos, then you can do so by becoming a Patreon and supporting this channel. I really appreciate your support. And although we couldn't save today's hard drive, I hope you enjoyed the content. Maybe you need to repair one of those rigid flex cables sometime in the future and could take some tips from today's video. Oh, and stay away from those quantum drives if you're looking for an old IDE drive. They are most likely all having the same issue as seen in today's episode. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.